connecting up to a loudspeaker and a battery. If I fill this with the granules, you'll hear it begin to crackle. Then fit a diaphragm, which is just a piece of plastic. If I cut my hand around it and speak quite loudly, you should be able to hear Bell's voice-shaped currents coming out of the speaker. And this type of microphone, in a refined version, was used in telephones right up to the late 70s. With Bell's receiver and Edison's microphone, the telephone became a practical proposition. At first, the telephone companies had to stress its usefulness in emergencies, because so few people had phones that they weren't much use for anything else. This is part of a film made for a New York phone company in 1910. The company's efforts were obviously successful. This is a pile of New York telephone directories a few years later. This is one of Edison's first telephones. You have to turn the handle all the time to hear anything through it. It's called the chalk receiver. This one's called the marriage. It's one of the phones to combine Bell's receiver and Edison's microphone. A lot of the early phones didn't have microphones as such, but uh, they just had these wooden sounding boards that, which acted as the diaphragm. You just had to speak somewhere near them. This is the bell that called the attention of the operator. This one's the horse collar phone. Uh, you put your head right in it for private conversations. One thing that uh, most of these early phones had in common was that the microphone was firmly fixed to the wall or to a base. And this uh, stopped the carbon granules moving around and crackling too much. The candlestick phone, which came into fashion in the 20s, was a sort of compromise. Although you could move the microphone around, it tended to keep the carbon granules at the same angle as you lifted it up. Carbon microphones were gradually improved until they could be fitted into handsets. And in fact, many are still in use, crackling away. None of the early phones had dials. You simply asked the operator at the exchange to connect you to the number you wanted. Early attempts at using mail operators are said to have been unacceptable because they were too rude. As the telephone system expanded, more and more telephone operators were needed. The rapidly growing number of telephone operators increased the incentive for some sort of automatic switching system. The answer was provided by the versatile electromagnet. I still use electromagnetic switches called relays in a lot of the machines I make. This is a nutcracker I made for an exhibition. relays control the motor. It's actually quite useful for being able to see what's going on and they're actually quite reliable. You can see one of their disadvantages though, the sparks gradually erode the contacts away.
The first successful automatic exchange was designed in desperation by an undertaker from Kansas City called Almond B. Strowger in 1889. Hmm, not enough people dying hereabouts, unless there's something funny going on. Let's see, there's my arch rival, McGreely. Hmm. He seems mighty busy all of a sudden. There's Mrs. McGreely going to work in telephone exchange. Hey, telephone. So sorry to hear about your recent bereavement, but we do have a special offer this week. Six coffins for the three That's and two interiors. That's it. She tells me who's dying. <gasps> So I'll make my own telephone exchange and cut out the third party. This is a Strowager selector made in the 1960s, and it's still surprisingly similar. There are two electromagnets. One makes this arm climb up, and the other one makes it hunt across, and finally resets it. Behind, there's a large bank of contacts. The arm sits in front. This connects to the dial. These are the clicks that you hear when, uh, whenever you dial a number. Many Strowger exchanges are still in use. This one's in Norwich. Although Strowger only imagined tiny exchanges with one contact for each subscriber, his selectors were soon being connected together to make larger exchanges like this. The engineers call the system affectionately click and bang. Keeping it all working is quite an undertaking. The contacts tend to get dirty and make the lines noisy, and the selectors need precise adjustment to work properly. Also, the mechanism gradually sheds tiny metal filings, literally wearing itself out. It's quite surprising it was at all. There quickly reaches a level where electromechanical devices become a bit absurd. This is a burglar enunciator in the 1930s. These premises are being broken into. Police, Scotland Yard, Police, Scotland Yard, Police, Scotland Yard. This is a Burgot automatic burglar alarm operating at J.E. The solution was a whole new technology with no moving parts. It was based on a device invented for telephone exchange switching in 1947, the transistor. It was credited to John Bardeen, Walter Brattain and William Shockley. Bardeen was the mathematician who developed the theory. Brattain was the practical experimenter who actually tried things out. Shockley was the leader of the team, a visionary aloof from the day-to-day -day experiments. He foresaw more advanced transistors developed years later and finally disgraced himself with his campaign for bribing people with low IQs to be sterilised. Okay, fella, you take the money and it won't hurt too much, okay? This is a modern transistor. A small amount of current in one side switches a much larger amount on the other side. Here I've hooked up the high power side of a transistor to a car battery and a headlight. And uh, if I'm moistening my fingers, I can now switch the transistor with the tiny amount of current passing through my body. Just touching the low power side of the transistor is enough to switch the light on and off. Solid state switching like this has enormous advantages. There are no mechanical parts to wear out, and of course there are no contacts to spare.